Okay, well, good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody here, and let's just begin with a word of prayer. Father, you set us in this world of choices. We're faced with choices between good and evil, between light and darkness. Lord, we're faced with the, uh, these choices, and these choices come to us, and, and we have to respond and, 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 or not respond. And we want you to, Lord, help us this morning to see clearly all these choices before us of right and wrong and help us, Lord, to choose right, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to read this starting at verse 11. And as I do, I just want you to think about the concept of choice as we read here in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 starting at verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, who, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself, upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs or signals, and for seasons or meaning times or holidays and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day, and God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living, thing, every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day, and God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, or in our resemblance, and after our likeness, or in our pattern, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb, or green vegetable, bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat. And every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every herb for meat and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now as we look a little bit in review we're talking about this morning light and darkness. That's the issue here. Light and darkness. We saw that God created light. This was a magnificent creation of God. We didn't cover it last week, but let me just ask you, why do you think God created light? Why did he do that? Was it, it was, did he create light so we wouldn't stub our toes when we get up at night to go to the bathroom? Or was it so that Albert Einstein could get the Nobel Prize for telling everybody that there's a relationship between light and, and, and energy and his theory of relativity? Or was it so we can read the menu at the Jewish delicatessen, D.Z. Akins? You know, one time 
we had one of our Japanese customers, and, and they were going to visit our company in, in, uh, in San Diego. Big deal. We, they had taken us around the sites in Tokyo, and now it was our turn. And we were going to show them San Diego, and they were looking forward to seeing San Diego, or as they say, San Diego. And so the plan was that when they would arrive, that we would pick them up at the airport and drive all around and show them San Diego. Well, their plane was a little late, and it was a little late, and it even got later. So when it arrived, it was already dark. <laughs> and so we, we, we said, well... We told you we'd take you on a tour. It's dark. We'll take you on a tour anyways. They said, okay. So we went on our tour anyways, and we took them up to the top of Point Loma there by Rosecrans Cemetery. And on one side, it overlooks beautiful San Diego Bay with North Island and Coronado and the skyline and the nuclear submarine base and the Navy, na naval station there and the aircraft carriers and just beautiful. Only trouble was it was all dark. And then on the other side, beautiful Pacific Ocean, sometimes the humpback whales. You can see them spouting water off there. Just a beautiful sight. But it was dark. And so I looked at him and I said, well, you can't see now because it's dark. But I said, if you could see, I said, if you could see, I got to tell you, over here is a very large bay. And below it, just across it, over there, is this massive naval air base on its island there. And just below that, there are runways crisscrossing. It's the longest amount of runways for, for, for airplanes of any naval base in the world. And they all looked out the window of the car into the darkness, and together they said, Oh! <laughs> And then I said, now you can't see it, but if you could just see over there's this massive bridge called the Coronado Bridge. It soars 300 feet over the water so all the large Navy ships can pass under it. And they looked way off into the darkness and they said, wow. <laughs> and so, so why did God make the light? So the Japanese could see San Diego? <laughs> God made the light as a symbol. He made the light to teach us. He loves us so much, he brings us into his classroom called Earth, and then he stocks the classroom with all kinds of teaching aids, and one of them is light. And, he's, and, and that's why he did it. And so he, when he came to Earth, later on, the Creator, when he came to Earth, he wanted to have something in his teaching aid in his classroom that he could use to explain to his, to his creation man some truth. So when he came in John 8, verse 12, it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now can you imagine? If he hadn't created a light, and he said, I am the light of the world, they would have looked at each other, and everybody looked at each other and says, what's light? But see, because he made light, and because he put that into the world as our teaching tool, so that it was really the purpose so that when he came, he could say, I am the light of the world. And he says, I am the light of life. And you know what life, light is to you? Da, 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 da. List, 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 list. God made the physical light as a teaching tool so that we could understand real light, spiritual light. You know, we live here in this earth, and we think, well, this is it. This is not it. What's it is what's not seen. What's seen is to teach us about what's not seen. The important world is the world of the unseen, the spiritual world. God created the spiritual world to help us understand about the spiritual world. So just as those Japanese customers, without the light, they, 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 they couldn't really understand what San Diego is like without the light. And so without the Lord Jesus Christ, we can't really understand who God is. But that's how Fanny Crosby, very interesting, songwriter, hymn writer, blind from a very early age. You could almost say she, she, her life she never saw. And, and she never really saw physical light, a very short time. But she wrote a hymn. She wrote a very, very interesting hymn. And the, the title of the hymn is, 
I see the light. She's blind. All of her life since she was a little girl. Blind. But here she says, I see the light. Let me, let me read to you some of the words that she wrote. I see the light. Tis coming. It breaks upon my soul. It streams above the tempest and ocean waves that roll. From skies with clouds o'ershadowed, the mist dissolves away. I see the light that leadeth to everlasting day. What a, what a word, everlasting day. With joy no words can utter, my heart is all aglow. I see the light of glory, now let the anchor go. She saw the light. She was blind, but she saw the real light, the Lord Jesus Christ. And she talked about the yearning in her soul for the place called the eternal day. Because she saw that real light and wrote the words of that song about the spiritual light, even though she was blind, an old Boston Harbor pilot, he had trusted Christ recently. And there he lay in his bed in Boston, dying. And his last words were the words of blind Banny Crosby. He's dying. And he says, I see the light of glory. Now let the anchor go. That's why God created the light. To teach us about the real light. Why was it created? It's a teaching symbol. So we could understand the most important thing that we have to understand in life, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greatest achievement. Now looking at light that way and asking why it was created, it raises an issue. It raises an issue of how are we to understand the scriptures? We're studying the Bible, so we want to know how are we to understand the Bible. When we read in Genesis something like God made the light, should we ask why did God make the light? As we study the scriptures, should we be asking, why did God do this and why did God do that? Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 11. It's an interesting passage because it's referring back to something in the Old Testament. And Paul is writing here, 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 11, and it says this, For it is written in the law, in the Torah, in the uh, first five books of Moses, it's written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he that all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope. And he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, it is, a great, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? You know, here, caught, here, here was a situation where God had told the Jewish people that when they use their ox to crush corn, don't muzzle the ox. Don't put a muzzle on the ox. Let them eat. Paul had taught us that in the scripture, we should be asking this question when we read it. I don't know. Would you ask that question? Paul says you need to ask the question when you read the passage that says when the ox treads out the corn, don't muzzle them, let them eat. So we should ask the question, why did God say, don't muzzle the ox, let them eat? Because Paul says, you think it was just for the ox? Paul says, no, it was for something more. He's teaching us. What's he teaching us? He's teaching us that as the ox works, let him eat. So that's what he was teaching us. If the feeding of the ox was the issue, well, then you could feed the ox before the work, so the ox wouldn't be hungry when he was crushing the corn. That was a very simple solution. But Paul was saying, Rabbi God was creating, in this instance, a teaching illustration, a teaching example for us. So that it goes like this. During the corn crushing, just as the ox would be thinking, I hope I get to eat some of this corn I'm crushing, it's right for the ministers of the word of God to hope 
that they'll be fed, that they'll be taken care of by those they are doing the, that there's their ministering to. See, that's right. And Paul said, that's right. It's a good thing. You know, one time there was a, an itinerant preacher. And the itinerant preacher was going from church to church back east, and he had his horse, and he would ride on his horse, and he would go to this church, and he would preach, and then he would get on his horse and go to the next church, and he would preach, and that's what he did. He was an itinerant preacher. The only thing about this preacher was that he was very skinny, very, very skinny. So, uh, but, the, but his horse was not skinny. So one, one time after church service, some of the men said to the preacher, Preacher, we have a question for you. The you know, preacher says, okay, what is it? And, and, and then the men said, why is your horse so fat and you're so skinny? And the preacher said, well, that's easy to understand. You see, I feed my horse and you feed me. <laughs> see the point he was making? <laughs> that goes along with don't muzzle the ox when he's treading out the corn. So when we study the scriptures, it's right for us, it's a good thing for us when we study the Bible to always be asking, why did God do that? Why did he say that? That's a good thing. Why did God do that? It's okay to have an answer, I don't know. That's okay, but ask. Because Rabbi God wants questions. He wants those kind of questions because he is teaching us something. He's teaching us as his children. So he creates the light and he creates the darkness. And we saw that. And who, and, 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 and so if we think about that, we ask the question, oh, if God lives in heaven, it's a place of light. It's a place of no darkness. And the devil lives in hell. It's a place of darkness. It's a place where there's no light. Why do we live on earth where there's a mixture of the two? There's a, like there's, a, there's a mixture of light and darkness. Something's very good. Something's very bad. Why do we do that? Why are we sort of suspended between heaven and hell in this place called earth where there is a combination of light and darkness? Good. So, question. Answer. Because God set the earth up as a place purposefully between heaven and hell. He set the earth up as a place purposefully of a place where there would be light and darkness. So that each person on this earth, he could see as he puts them, puts each person on this earth and he could see what will each person choose. This is a place of choice. When God made man in his image, that means that God gave to each man choice. God gave to everyone the power to choose. He crowned him the sovereign God, crowned each man with the sovereignty of choice. And he could see if each man is going to choose light or darkness, heaven, hell, life, death, and he gives to man this power to choose, and then he honors the choice that man has made. You know, you see that? We see that in Genesis 2, 9. You might want to just, Genesis 2, 19, 2, 19. This verse says, and out of the ground, the Lord God formed, he yatsard, he squeezed into shape every beast of the field and every fowl and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. What words in this verse show us that God is giving man a choice, that he's going to honor man's choice? It's right there. Very significant words in this verse. If you are into underlining the Bible, then here's some words you want to underline. I, I, I'm not into underlining the Bible, my Bible, but nevertheless, if you like to, go ahead. Under. God formed Yatsar. He squeezed it like a potter. He squeezed that, that, that just right. He got it just right, just like a potter does. And then when it was afterward, he went, Mwah! like that. And he said, Metzion, Yofi, this is perfect. He did that with every beast. In every fowl, 
And what do we do as scientists? I'm a scientist. What do we do as scientists? We study. I study the biochemistry of these things. And I do. And sometimes I just want to go, Mwah! it was a great job you did. Because oh, he, he's got it just right. Second, he brought these animals to Adam. And why did God bring every beast and every fowl that he had made to Adam? Because it says he wanted to see what he would call them. That's amazing. God's the Yatsar Parter. He's the one who's the creator. He should be the one to name it. But he made man kind of like a partner with him. And so he says to man, okay, I know I made it. You name it. I mean, these were perfectly created animals. Adam, I hope you're up to the job here. You better come up with some perfect names. Can you imagine this? These are God's creations. God has let man now do the naming. Because it says God wanted to see. God had wanted to ra'ar. He wanted to see. He wanted to enjoy. He wanted to enjoy what man would call them. God was really interested in man's choices and what he would make. Think about that next time you pray to God. That God is, is ra'ar. He wants to enjoy what you're going to say to him in prayer. What words are you going to use? Because that's of great interest to God. Just like God was interested in the names that Adam was going to choose, God is very interested to see the words that you're going to choose in prayer. We should think when we pray. We should not use these heartless, dead repetitions that he told us not to do when we pray. God listens to us praying, and, and, and we, it, it shouldn't be that God should say to himself, oh, another religious cliche? I think that's number 132. No, we shouldn't put God through that. He wanted to see what Adam would choose for the names, and he wants to see what we choose to pray for, and how we pray for, and what words that we're going to speak. What are our requests? You think this verse indicates that those animal names were predestined before Adam was created? You think that this verse is indicating that those animal names were elected by God from the foundation of the world and that Adam had this irresistible urge to name those animals what, that, what God had already predestined them to be named? Not at all! That's not the way the verse is reading. The verse is reading that, Adam, it's totally your choice, 100%. Your choice, Adam. I'm kind of, and God's saying, I'm kind of enjoying what you're going to name them. And then it says, fourth, whatsoever Adam called them every living creature, that was the name thereof. That means that God honored Adam's choice. And so angels also, they were probably watching it to find out, I wonder what Adam's going to name this animal. And, and, and he starts off strong, and, and Adam does, and he, a big, big animal comes along, and, and, and God brings the big animal and said, okay, Adam, what's the name of this one? And Adam says, hippopotamus. And God says, okay, hippopotamus it is. And God brings another animal, and, and Adam says, what's this one, Adam? He goes, horse. Well, God didn't say something like, Adam, maybe we should slow down a little bit. Uh, I wanted to show you a little bit about this animal. I mean, uh, you know, he, he pumps blood every, from his feet when he runs. I mean, it's a, it's a horse, horse, Adam. I mean, do you want to reconsider? He didn't do that. God didn't do that. God said, I gave Adam the choice. I told Adam, Adam, you make the choice, and it's going to be your choice, and whatever you choose, that's it. It sticks. That's what God did. God brought a small insect with wings. And Adam said, fly. And the angels might have said, fly. Can he do better than that? Fly? And God said, that's Adam's choice. It's fly it is. And the fish was waiting along and he says, oh great, what's my name going to be? Swim? So, but the point is, is that God gave to Adam the choice to name the animals, and then God honored his choice. It wasn't a game. It wasn't a game where, where God said, Adam, you decide, but really God had already decided, and it was predestined and pre and, and Adam had this irresistible urge to, it wasn't that way at all. God was good and transparent. What he said to Adam, he meant. When he told Adam, you have 100% ch choice in this matter, he did.
and he honored that choice. When God presents the gospel to any lost sinner and says, it is your choice, you can go to heaven, it's your choice, he means it. He has given to that person the power to choose. There's none of this, 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 this God is, is predestinating the sinners to hell. These sinners are already going to hell. It's been defi- decided long before he was born. He can do nothing about it. He won't get the, but we'll just tell him that, oh yeah, but you can go to heaven. You can go to heaven if you just choose. But all the while we know he's not. That's not true. That's like picturing God saying to a paraplegic, if you can just climb up this staircase, you go to heaven knowing full well that he can't do it. That's not it. God gives choice and God gives choice and it is man's choice and God honors choice, just as in the naming of the animals. So number one, God looks at each individual man as he goes about his individual life on earth this life where he is in the middle of light and darkness. Number two, God asks the question, will this man choose darkness or light? Will this man look at at his own life and say, you know, my sin, it's not so bad. I'm not that bad. I mean, I've never murdered. I've never committed adultery. I made a few mistakes in life. Like everyone else, I'm just human. God looks... And when he sees a person take that position on the sinners of his life, number three, God writes down darkness, darkness. That person has chosen darkness as opposed to a person who looks at their lives and says, oh, I'm a sinner. I really am a sinner. Oh, God, have mercy on me. I'm a lost sinner. God says, write down light, light. See, when you look at Luke 18, 9 through 14, you see this so dramatic, this, this, this contrast. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. See, they were trusting in themselves that they were righteous. Let me tell you, that's what the Bible calls darkness. And so they were trusting in themselves that they were righteous, and it says, and despised others. And then he said, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee, the other was a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this publican. I fast twice in the day. I give tithes of all that I possess. Then the Lord Jesus Christ went on to say, and the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as his uh, uh, lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a lost sinner. I, the Lord said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. See? Two men, he said, went to pray. Two men with two opposite decisions. Two men with two opposite decisions about how they saw themselves before God. One decides that God should be impressed with him. He has exalted himself over the others with words like, I am not like him. That Pharisee thinks, If I am not a sinner, in fact, I'm a righteous person, what do I need a Savior for? I don't need the Lord Jesus Christ to die for my sins. I don't need anybody to die for my sins. I don't have any sins. They're not bad enough for anybody to die for. That Pharisee has decided that he is righteous before God. God looked, God saw, God wrote down, that Pharisee chose darkness, just like with the animals with Adam. God brought the animals to Adam, see what he would name them, God brought that Pharisee into the world of light and darkness. Pharisee chose darkness of saying that he was a sinner, not, and there was not a sinner, not in need of a Savior. So when the Pharisee was presented with God's salvation light, when the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into this world, he loved darkness rather than light because his deeds were evil. And God wrote down, his decision was darkness. On the other hand, it happened. Look at this publican. He says, God, be merciful to, merciful to me, a sinner. 
He says, I'm a sinner. He says, I deserve hell. He says, everything that that Pharisee said he was not, I am. Color me the adulterer, the sinner. I am the sinner before God. Just as God brought the animals to Adam to see what he would name them, so God brought this publican into the world of his world, his filtering world of light and darkness, and that publican, he chose light by saying, I'm a sinner before God. I am in great need of a Savior. When he was presented with God's salvation, when the light of God's salvation came into this world, he loved light rather than darkness, and God wrote that decision down, light, and saved him, justified him. Whatsoever Adam called every creature, that was the name thereof. God honors the decision that man makes. There's no such thing as God making decisions for another person. God brings each person into the world and he looks to see what is his decision for either the light of salvation from his sins or the darkness of self-righteousness. And that decision is recorded, just like with Adam naming the animals. And it determines, that decision determines whether a person will have a destiny of heaven or hell, just that simple. The more we realize this, the more we will try to influence people to make decisions to choose God's salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our job is described in 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. When you look at the word ambassador, you can substitute the word influencer, persuader. So you can say this verse, we are influencers for Christ. We are persuaders for Christ. Just like God was pleading with the lost, we plead with the lost also in the place of the Lord Jesus Christ to be reconciled to God. Let me ask you, how did it go for you? How did it go for you this last week in your influencing and your persuading some lost person to come to the light that they are a sinner and in need of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because we want to, number one, rule in all of life, not make God mad. Number two rule in all of life, make God happy. Number three rule for all of life, take God seriously. And then, then, so therefore, you and I are going to embrace the truth that this earth is a sorting place. We're going to come to that. Every day we're going to come to this conclusion. I am entering the world of a sorting place. It is a filter place. It is a testing place for souls to make their decisions for or against God's salvation light, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will work for the lost to be saved, even when it is hard. And sometimes it's very hard. Like this last week, a Jewish friend of mine, he prayed to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. He went home, he thought about it. I think his wife helped him also to think about it. And he told me this last week, he has decided to turn back, turn back. That's a heartbreak. As hard as it is, I said to myself, I will work to persuade. I will work to influence. I will work as long as there is breath in the lungs for them, for him, for others to repent and to not turn back before it's too late because when it's over, it is over. Now, we look at the fruit tree and now we come to the creation of the seed. Genesis 1.11 And God said, wonderful words, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb uh, green vegetables yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth. It was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw it was good. You know, God set up this system of the seeds. And there's two characteristics about the, the, the seed. Let's talk about f- fruit tree seed, for example, as stated here in verse 11 and 12. First, it says, and it's repeated three times, after its kind, after its kind, after its kind. God faithfully made each tree or the grass to produce seed after his kind. You know what you never see? 
You will never see an apple tree ever produce a papaya tree. After billions and billions of apple trees, you think that if an apple tree could ever make a papaya tree, that once out of the billions and billions there'd be a papaya tree. But there's never been one. Never been a papaya tree that comes from an apple tree. No one's ever seen an apple tree ever produce a papaya tree. Johnny Appleseed didn't see it for all of his plantings. No one has ever seen it. Why? Because God said that each tree will produce a seed after its kind. That's a problem for evolution, because evolution, there's never been a mutation, either observed naturally or induced artificially, where an apple tree will make something other than an apple tree. Every seed will make the tree after its kind. What's the second characteristic of the fruit tree? It's stated in verses 11 and 12. Fruit whose seed was in itself. When God created man in verse 27, he gave to man instructions. What food did he tell him he could eat? He told him that in verse 29. God gave to man, here you go, Adam, this is good food. This is herbs and greens. These are vegetables. These are fruits. And he says, this is, he calls it meat. I wouldn't call it meat, but that's what God called it. He called it meat. He didn't bring him a T-bone steak. He didn't say, Adam, now this is meat. He said, these fruits and these vegetables are herbs. This is meat, meat for you. And so Adam, Adam didn't know any better. He didn't know anything about T-bone steak. It's like Dr. Contreras in Mexico. He asked me, he says, what will it take for you to go on a serious diet and become a vegan? And I sat there and for a minute I said, I should, be, I should go on a serious diet and become a vegan. And Dr. Contreras has just asked me, what will it take for me to become a vegan? So I said, just one word. And I looked up at him and I said, death. <laughs> death. Now picture the scene. God put the trees in the garden. And let's say God put one orange tree in the garden, and, and he would put one avocado tree. And Adam loved the oranges. Oh, he just loved for the, he didn't like the avocados, but he loves the oranges. So Adam eats up all the oranges off the one orange tree, and then Adam says, uh, God, can you make some more orange trees for me? I, 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 I want to have more oranges in, in the garden. So what does God do? He, 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 he looks at him, and, and, and he says, did you understand what I said? He, he would have said to Adam, the fruit of the tree yielding seed. He said, Adam, I put the seed for you inside the fruit. To get more trees like that, you gotta, it's like the prize in the Cracker Jacks box, Adam. Get the seed, go get the seed. You know, that little irritating thing you kept spitting out? Go get it, Adam, and plant it. Now put yourself in Adam's shoes. You've never done this before. First time you've heard this. You see this big fruit tree. It's created fruit tree. Big fruit tree. It's in the garden there. And you want more of those nice big fruit trees. And you don't understand why he has those irritating little hard things in the fruit in the first place. But, and, 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 but, but, and you want more. And you kind of think, and, you, and, and you, so now you've got a decision. i never seen this happen before, Adam could say. But somehow this irritating little hard thing God said, it's a little tiny little thing. It's a big tree over here, but there's like a little tiny little seed here. And God says, if I put that in the ground, it's going to turn into that, that huge tree. You know, Adam could sit there and he could, he, could, he could argue with God. He could say, no way. You're pulling my leg. I should plant this little tiny thing and it's going to become that big thing and I'm going to eat tree. He said, no way. Because you've never seen it before. But what happened? God says, Remember three principles. Adam, don't make God mad. He told you. Adam, make God happy. Do it. Adam, take God seriously. He told you. So, so, what, so in other words, we want to say to Adam, 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 we've seen it. We've seen it. It really does work. Believe God. Plant the seed, Adam. Plant the seed. You know, we go to people. We tell them, if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, when you die, you will go to heaven. Never, they've never seen it before. Just like Adam. Believe what God said. Take him seriously. Because you and I, we're like Paul, who said in Acts 27, 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That's what faith is. Believing God as he told it. He said, confess your sin. Come to him as a sinner. Throw open the door of your heart. Receive him as your Savior. You'll be forgiven. You'll be a child of God. You'll live forever. Believe it. Just like that. What? What has he told us? Hebrews 9, 27. It is appointed 
unto men once to die. After that, the judgment. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned, that's the blanket statement, and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord is not slack, concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many is God willing to slip through the cracks? None. How many does God want saved? All should come to repentance. Acts 2.21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever American, whosoever Ethiopian, whosoever Japanese, whosoever Tanzanian, whosoever Eskimo, whosoever Mexican, whosoever anywhere, God says, anyone call on the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. Just like with Adam. Are we going to believe that? Plant the seed, Adam. Call on the name of the Lord. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Luke 8, 5. A sower went out to sow seed. Luke 8, 11. Parable is this. The seed, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word, God says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, he says, it won't return to me void, but it shall accomplish that for which I I, I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Like Adam, we not only need to believe what God said about the seed, to get more fruit, about the seed of the word of God, we need to plant it like Adam. Not just believe that it can happen, but do it, plant it into the hearts of people. Because if we believe that God is not willing that any should perish, then we will take on God's anxiety for people that are perishing and are unnecessarily going to hell. Let's Let's today resolve with all of our heart to be like Adam. Picture ourselves for the first time. We got the seed. God told me, plant the seed, I'll have the tree. Let's be like Adam. We got the seed. It's called the Word of God. God says, plant the seed, and people will be saved, and it will accomplish. Let's do that today. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for calling us to be your holy influencers, your holy persuaders, Lord, to get the lost, to decide, to follow the instructions in the word of God, to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ so they can be saved from their sins. In Jesus' name, amen.